our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ spoke no greater truth than when he said, and this is the judgment that light is come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their works were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light and cometh not to the light lest his works should be reproved. But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, that his works may be made manifest, that they have been wrought in God. John 3, 19 through 21. Again, our Lord warned, if the world hateth you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. John 15, 18 through 19, of course, specifically that had to do with the apostles and their work. Now the choice between good and evil is always before us. We must either choose the will of heaven, make whatever adjustments in our life necessary to comply with the mandates of Prince Emmanuel, or we're going to choose evil. There are no other choices relative to pleasing God. So when we look at the dealings of Christ, and look at the work of other righteous characters, and I'm thinking now particularly of the forerunner of the Christ to the Jews, John the Immerser. Then there are several things we can learn, but specifically to one John preached to. And that was Herod the Tetrarch, who was the son of Herod the Great. And what got John in trouble with Herod and Herodias in that adulterous union? It was a simple thing. He didn't have to say it. But in Mark 6, 18, we see that John was very bold in speaking the truth that Herod needed. No doubt he needed a number of truths to make his life as pleasing to God. But concerning his present wife, he simply declared, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Mark 6, verse 18. Now when all is said and done, as far as the consequences in this world, concerning John for having said that to who he said it to, it cost him his head. But John did not live for this life. He did not live to be a man pleaser. His home, ultimately, finally, and eternally, was not this world. Those who have been faithful to God, whether it be back in the patriarchy, such as Abraham, or during the time of the Mosaical Dispensation or now the Christian Dispensation, if they were faithful to God under whatever law God had for them at that time, they did not live for the here and now. Ultimately, finally, completely, they lived for eternity. And they knew what they did or did not do here on earth in the flesh had much to do with where they would be in eternity. And when it comes to religious and moral matters, they must be according to God's law in our lives. Now, an adulterous marriage, and I use that in an accommodative sense, because in reality, when you're living in adultery, God hasn't joined you together at all in marriage, Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. 
And it makes no difference what civil law says about it. If it contradicts God's law, it does not supersede God's law. Back some years ago, not that many years ago, some of us had quite a set to with some of our other brethren who tried to say, well, if civil law has decreed you're divorced or if civil law has decreed you're married, then that's the way it is with God. And back in those days, we would point out to them, well, then if the Supreme Court or the legislature or whatever declares homosexual marriages are acceptable, then I suppose they are then marriage is acceptable to God. Oh, no, no, that never will happen. That kind of thing never will happen. Well, I haven't seen many of those people in recent years. But if I do, I may walk right up to them and say, well, I guess it did happen. Now, where are you now? We comply with civil law because Romans makes it clear, Paul did there, that we're to obey civil law when it does not involve contradicting and going against God's law. Now, you've got to realize Herod and Herodias were the civil law. <laughs> Herodias was married to Philip, who was also a Herod. Herod Tetrarch, who John addresses here, had married originally the daughter of the king of Arabia. But he put her away and married Philip, or rather Philip's wife, Herodias. So it just sounds like America, doesn't it? <laughs> so this was the day that Herod could have chosen to correct his sinful life in that area. He could have repented of the sin. But he personally chose to ignore the warning and probably if it had been left up to him, he probably would have just turned a deaf ear and a blind eye to it and gone on. But it incensed Herodias. It got her very angry. And since we have been using chickens here lately and talking about eggs, it made her so mad as an old wet hen. <laughs> now, our... If maybe we need to find out when we see a hen wet, especially if she's sitting to understand how mad that can be. But she wasn't going to have any of it. Even to the point of using her daughter, Salome, to dance an enticing dance to get Herod to make vows and so forth that he hated that he did. But she was, you would call her a designing woman. And she intended to cause the death of John the Baptist, and she did. People must be warned today. The sermon this morning ties into this one because it's a good example of when you preach what people love to do and point out that it's wrong and they need to change, it shows you how far people will go. It is a sin to refuse to repent but it's also a sin on our behalf to refuse to warn people. We talked about Ezekiel, Ezekiel 33, 1 through 9, is sort of the watchman on the wall. That's the very point being made. We don't appreciate those things much today because it's been hundreds, even thousands of years since people had to have walls around the communities they lived in. They would go out of those walls and work their fields, and then in time of threat they would come within the walls and so they had watchmen that all through the night they would watch and they would announce on the hour usually two o'clock and all is well or something like this and that was as much part of that culture when that was done as things are today for us but they took that the inspiration did and said, your obligation as people of God on this earth is to warn people of the impending eternal doom awaiting them if they don't turn from the errors of their way and obey God. People talk about loving other folks, caring about them. Well, if the Lord's church, in view of what it is, doesn't love other folks enough to say, if you keep on this road, you will be in hell when life is over, I don't think we can say we really love them. 
just read 1 Corinthians 13 and then make application in the area we're in right now and look at the watchman on the wall and his duty and see if the Lord's church, the body of Christ, is not to be warning the world of what is to come and why they need to turn to God and obey the gospel and live righteous lives. Remember, it was the Apostle Paul who could honestly declare to the Ephesian elders that he was pure from the blood of all men. And it was for one reason. He shrank not from declaring unto them all of the whole counsel of God, Acts 20 and verse 27. I guess the question I need to ask, you need to ask everyone, am I pure from the blood of all men in view of the circles that I walk in? People may not accept the truth. So many people won't. But that doesn't lessen our obligation to make them fully aware of the truth in their, their lives that they need to embrace. When you look at Herod, uh, you realize that fear alone will not suffice. Have you ever noticed Mark 6.20? The scripture plainly reads, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. Well, I think I've seen that in working with the brethren. I remember one brother said one time, many, many years ago to me, he was a good man, sound in the faith, had served in another congregation as elder, and had in that one served as an elder. But he said, one reason preachers who are godly men can only stay a few years at a congregation is that in most instances, the cranks and the contentious people and the worldly people in that church know that after about two, three, four years, they're found out and the preacher now knows they're not what they're cracked up to be or what they pretend to be. And it's time to get a new preacher. That gives them another three or four years lease on life. You say, people wouldn't think that way. Are we that naive? Have you ever heard of Ananias and Sapphira right in the presence of the apostles that they would conjure up something in their own minds and agree to it as husband and wife that involved lying? All in the name of doing God's word. Now let me ask you a question. There may be several reasons that's in your Bible, but I know one reason it's there. People in the church can be as worldly and wicked as people outside the church. And we're foolish to think otherwise. Herod feared John. He was afraid of him. But he still could not bring himself to forsake his wicked ways. And the prophets of old, such as Isaiah and Isaiah 55.7, brings that out. Certainly, a fear can be a good motivation to do what is right before God. But what I'm saying is, is that fear only, fear only will not save. There are countless thousands of people even today who still fear an eternal hell as it's described in the scriptures as we studied recently. But fear does not guarantee complete obedience to the gospel or living the Christian life as a child of God. Also, Herod was enslaved by another person's opinion. Herod was enslaved by another's opinion. In Mark 6 and verse 17, it's said of Herod that Herod laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, Mark 6, 17. Now, if you've lived any length of time, especially working as a preacher, I promise you, you have seen times even among certain elders when there would be an agreement made, and then when it got back to a wife or wives of some of the elders, and they found out about it, uh, that wasn't what they wanted, and the next elders' meeting, then for some reason or another, that elders changed his mind. That kind of thing has happened all over the place, and it happened with Herod. It is, as one has, I think, truthfully said, 
the voice of lust gets the victory over the voice of conscience and of God. Too often that's the case. We don't realize that when we hear the truth, maybe we weren't aware of it, but we hear it now and we fully understand it. We've made application in our lives. And what happens? Well, we're really not prepared to go that far. And we start figuring out the ways around it. And our faith's tested. And our love of God's tested. And the love of the Word is tested. And frankly, we came up with a great big F. I'm reminded of what one college teacher said one time when the student complained after taking the test that he had an F. And he came up and put his paper down on the desk of the professor and said, why did I get an F on this? He said, because I couldn't give you any lower grade. Well, a lot of times it only takes one, and it seems like to me, F for failed, you don't need to say anything else. People today are enslaved by what others say about the Bible, or about God, or about true New Testament Christianity. And it happens sometimes in the strangest of places. You know, the marriage in the home originated in the mind of God and is revealed for the good of man. When Adam was created and God points out there that there was nobody to be a suitable help for him out of all of creation, woman was created especially to be that suitable help. Well, that means she has a special appeal to him. She is a compliment to him. But if that compliment is not a compliment, and Herodias certainly was not an accompl a compliment to Herod, had no right to be where she was in the first place, then it becomes a bad situation. And she got what she wanted by hook or by crook. There was no honesty about it. She just wanted it the way she wanted it. She was not going to allow this itinerant preacher to stand up and declare, you all are living outside the boundaries of the law. So it's still the case that many love the glory that is of men more than the glory that is of God. John chapter 12, verse 43. Opinions of men don't matter. Opinions of men are just guesses. That's all they are. And somebody says, well, just an educated guess. I don't care if it's educated or not. It's still a guess. It's not what our faith is based on. Faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And it's God's word that will judge us, John 12 and verse 48. And he ought to have thought of John as somebody who loved him who cared for him, wanted him to be on the side of God, but he didn't. He only thought of one thing, especially after Herodias got a hold of him, and that was, I've got to live with her, so I don't have to live with John. So he agreed to uphold his vow he had made before others rather than be embarrassed and cause the death of John. Notice how Herod was ensnared by the dance that Salome performed for him. Now, Herod could have refused to see the dance or allow that kind of thing to happen. After all, he is king. But by his own choice, he permitted the thing to happen. And Mark 6, 22 says, well, that dance pleased him. It never fails that when one refuses God's warning, he finds it quite easy to indulge in sinful pleasure. And sometimes because their sin or sins is graphically portrayed and they're very condemned and they don't want to change, that's the demarcation point to go ahead and just live even further a life of sin. It's strange how that works. But if you justify yourself in one sin, you certainly can go through the same process to justify yourself in another sin. 
And the sad part about it is, is that in husband-wife relationships and in parents with their children, what they decide to teach and the examples they set and what they say is going to influence their children. And so their attitude toward God, toward their fellow man, toward the gospel, toward the Bible, toward the church, and they don't even realize it. But that's what happens because no one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. We impact others by the way that we conduct our lives and what we say. I've never quite understood why parents don't think enough to realize that what I'm saying and doing or not doing, as the case may be, and not saying is going to send my children to torment if they follow the same line I'm going. When you think of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, or you think of God using Israel to destroy the Canaanites in the land of Canaan, People that think any at all realize, well, that means that pregnant women died, little boys and little girls died, little babies died. Well, the creator of all the earth also is the creator of life. He controls it all. He can end it or start it or do what he pleases with it. But don't we realize that when he destroys a place like Sodom and Gomorrah and that involves the destruction of children and babies, that he stopped them from growing up and becoming like their parents and, and, and others who were in sin? How many babies were led into eternity as innocent babes because God did not permit them to be raised in the atmosphere and environment of their mamas and daddies. We should not sit in judgment on God. What gives us even the thought that we can sit in judgment upon God? God knows every heart. All there is about it to know, He knows. He knows where we're going. And when you read the Bible, knowing what all He says about the power of the home and teaching and training, and rearing children, then assuredly he knows that if I terminate a Sodom and Gomorrah, I have stopped all those innocent children from growing up to be like their parents. It was surely by the grace and maybe the dexterity of the dancer that please Herod. We have warned parents, and recently here it was done, for years about training their children. And part of that is letting them be a part of modern day dance. Not only, as was pointed out, Andrew in his lesson not long ago about the stuff that goes on around the kind of dancing that's done nowadays. But the very dancing itself, the gyrations that go on are all rooted in sexual appeal. So it was nothing short of fleshly lust that motivated Herod to make his infamous promise I would like to say regarding the matter of dancing regardless of how wicked people are after the dance or what goes on around the dance and that's true it is bad the very modern day performance of the dance itself is wicked regardless if everybody else is not wicked after it's just wrong itself. Now, I found that a rather interesting sermon to deliver one time back when I was a freshman in college because I took speech. And we had to deliver a speech that was designed to persuade. It had to be a persuasive speech. So, state college campus and that kind of class, I preached on how it's wrong to dance. 
And I don't think some of those students had ever even considered or ever even thought of it or heard of such a thing. And it was about as good as later on when I was working on a master's degree, I preached one to a college class on abortion. <laughs> I almost laughed like that when I was giving it, not in the sense that I wanted them to think it was a light matter, but because they came out of homes that were so ignorant of the whole thing, they hadn't thought about it till they heard it right then. Well, I assure you, it's far worse than it was 40 some odd years ago when I, and even 50 years ago when I delivered some of these. A promise made only because of excitement is rarely ever good. Someone said one time, if you're under a lot of pressure or it's late at night and you're tired or you're very excited, whatever has got you excited, it's not the time to make serious decisions. Sleep on it. We used to have a saying when we were working in child care when the kids would come up and would ask us something that the house parents had sent them over to us to ask if it'd be all right to do. And we would tell them, well, if you want an answer right now, it's no. If you give us a while to weigh it in the balance to consider it, it could be a yes. Well, that's the way I think about it. You know, you, every decision you make is not like your clothes are on fire. I would find it a very rare thing if somebody's coat's on fire and he's trying to figure out what to do. You automatically know what to try to do. But how many decisions are that way? You can take time to think about it and weigh it in the balances of God's truth before you give an answer. And individually for ourselves that's true and it's also true of so many other things. We need time to think some things through. I remember the late Brother Woods many years ago saying when he was still editor of the Gospel Advocate, he said, we've got so many problems flying up here and there in the brotherhood that I don't even have time to really study one like I like to, till here's another one. Well, how much more so is that true of parents and the weighty work they have to do in rearing children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? So I think a good answer to a lot of children and even elders to the church sometimes, if you've got to have an answer right now to this, it's no unless we have a chance to think it through and weigh it all as we ought to, then we'll see if that will change. It just may be that Herod had, I don't know how to say it, goose pimples all over him his heart may have been racing away, pitter-patter, pitter-patter, more than once. Here's what he said, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom, Mark 6, 23. That's a stupid answer, a promise to make to Salome. But it was brought home because of the excitement she created in him Now that dance. One is observed sin first interest, then excites, and then captivates. And the God of pleasure and the God of passion continues to captivate the hearts of most people in America today. Just look at the television. I hate to even say it that way because look at what they put on there because, look, they're not going to put anything on there that doesn't make them money. And what makes them money are the people that watch it. So they have everything in there they think that people want to hear or see. The song says, yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. And Herod experienced the barbs of sin. He didn't expect Herodias to say, I want the head of John the Baptist, Mark 4, verse 24. And you could see it impacted, but not enough to cause him to repent. It says he was exceeding sorry, but for the sake of his oaths and for them that set at meat or the meal with him, he would not reject 
her, Mark 6, 23. How often does that happen? In one way or the other about certain things. I can't afford to back out now. A lot of folks start digging a hole and they don't know what else to do but keep digging the hole. They never seem to find a way out of it even though they know they're digging a hole and getting deeper into it all the time because they've just gone so far. I would say if anything will keep people from being saved is that they get themselves so deep in the hole it involves too much of them to come out of the hole. Yes, they can be saved. God will forgive every sin, but only when you comply with His will pertaining to the forgiveness of sins. So when one sells himself or herself to sin, you become a slave to another. He actually, Herod, became a slave to his adulterous wife and his daughter. I wish that people would realize the pleasures of this life, no matter how right they are, are only temporary when it comes to the flesh. And so many times what starts out is just a pleasure to the flesh turns into a bone-chilling consequence that's with us the rest of our lives. It becomes a too-late thing. And going back to an old saying of years ago, the Pied Piper must be paid his due. If we could just realize when we make decisions, there are consequences to follow. Always will be. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's just the way it is. So if you want to reap corruption, then just sow to the affairs of this present world. Doesn't have to be a situation as bad as Herod's was. It could be just simply, I don't want to get involved. That causes too many problems. And so you just seek an easy way out. I think I've used this before, but it's a good one maybe to close with. And it was told by a preacher many, many years ago. There was a man who seemed to be getting along with everybody in the office building. He was a, a janitor. I don't know what they call them nowadays. Janitor's probably not politically correct, but that's what I grew up with. But he kept the whole office building. And everybody around him noticed he just had such a wonderful relationship with the people in the different offices and different companies that were there in the whole building. Somebody asked him one time, said, called his name and said, well, how is it? We've noticed over the years you can do this, that you just have such a wonderful relationship. There seems to be never any friction or anything between you and anybody. He says, oh, well, I just go where I'm pushed. Well, believe it or not, while we might not say that to ourselves, there's some of us, if we don't watch out, we turn down involvement that's very important to see the church be what God wants it to be because we know there's going to be friction if we take on responsibility, if we discharge obligations. I've often said a person in going to college or whatever schooling he's going through, he ought to have to work at least two years in the public and deal with the public. And he'd understand far better what it's like to deal with people and he would hone some skills that he won't hone any other way. Well, when you're a Christian, you deal with brethren and you deal with others. Sometimes you have to deal with a Herod but even then, sometimes you've got to deal with a Judas Iscariot. But then you come down to one and you're appalled and you have to withstand Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. And there's no escaping those responsibilities are transferring them over to somebody else and saying, well, I just don't like friction. I just don't like problems. Christ didn't like being nailed to the cross, but he went anyway. And I need not tell you why he went. It's because he loved our souls. So 
when you look at these lessons, and there may be others that could be learned from Herod and the way he received the truth John told him, let it cause us to apply these things to every other area of life as we strive to study the Bible and, and live the Christian life. And may we ever be willing to learn from this sad occasion in the life of King Herod. Let us resolve highly from the heart that our allegiance belongs only to God. When push comes to shove, we're going to obey God. And now with that in mind, you just call back to mind your own personal study of the Old Testament and how that those godly men listed, if no other place in Hebrews 11, always chose to do God's will, no matter how painful the choice to them it was. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we would urge you and we would humbly ask you to consider why aren't you? Why aren't you a Christian? Do you know right from wrong? Do you know you're obligated to God? Are you aware of the fact that you're accountable for your thoughts and your words and your actions? Why aren't you a Christian? You know what to do if you've been around here much about hearing the gospel of Christ and believing in Christ, what that means. Repenting of your sins. If you heard this morning's sermon, you ought to know that. Confessing your faith in Christ and being baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. And then take your part as a responsible Christian in doing the Lord's work and thereby preparing for eternal glory in heaven. So you need to obey the gospel of Christ, God's power to save you, Romans 1.16. As a child of God, how active are you in the church? You mean faithful to him and using your talents to spread the gospel to help out in the work of the church. If you have sinned in those areas, please repent of them, come confessing them and pray God for forgiveness. We sing this song now that's designed to cause you to think about these things and apply them to your own life. And in so doing, encourage you to obey the truth. We urge you to do that then while we stand, while we sing.